Hello, hello, ladies and gentlemen, tall and short, young and old, and everything in between. Welcome to another episode of The Daily Friend Show. I'm your host, Nicholas Lorimer, and I'm joined today uh, by another powerful contingent from the East Rand of Johannesburg, of Gauteng, uh, and that is, of course, Mr. Marius Root. Marius, how are you? How's it, Nick? Hello, Becky. That was so unenthusiastic, Marius. After Hello, uh, Nick. How's it going? Actually. So glad to see there you. There we go. Much better. Uh, 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 and uh, the glorious son of uh, Boxburg, I believe it is, himself, uh, Mr. Becky McClobo. Becky, how are you? I'm well and yourself, Nick. How's it, Marius? Right. So let us get into the show here. And uh, it's good that we have Becky on today because it means he has, we have someone who knows something about economics, which is uh, which would not be the case if it was just me and Marius. <laughs> and uh, we have... A story in, who is it? Biz News, I think. Uh, Business, Business Tech. tech. Business Tech. Um, reporting on the Afro-Asia Bank in collaboration with New World Wealth, published what they called their African Wealth Report for 2021. And this is highlighting the trends of, of Africa's ultra-wealthy people, uh, basically the state of wealth in Africa. And there are some pretty shocking results about South Africa. Well, they're not terribly unexpected. Um, and that is that the number of millionaires in South Africa who pay a very large percentage of our income tax, actually, if you if you look at uh, which category uh, of which category of taxpayers pays the most tax, I think it's probably millionaires in South Africa. Um, and the number of millionaires has decreased uh, by one has decreased by 1900 um, from uh, to, to so it's now to $36,500 millionaires, that's US dollar millionaires living in South Africa. And this is uh, after there was already a decrease in 2020. Um, there's also, they found uh, been a reduction in private wealth held in South Africa by 25% over the last decade. And this comports with some of the findings um, of, our, of our colleague, Gabriel Krauser, who's very interested in, in wealth and that kind of thing, that South Africa is a country where wealth is destroyed, not really created. It's, uh, it's, it's almost as if we're constantly emerging from a world war, is how he, he describes our economic situation. So I guess my question uh, to you, Becky, let's start off with you, is why is South Africa failing to build up wealth and what are the negative consequences of being able to maintain wealth in the country? Yeah, so unfortunately on this particular wealth destruction topic, it just speaks to the broader theme that I see coming from Pretoria in that we have sort of moved from wealth creation policies to now wealth destruction policies. Uh, and we can also see this in the language that's been used by ANC members. The objective of economic growth is not just that of economic growth. It now needs to be inclusive economic growth. In other words, it is growth that is um, that is controlled by the hand of the ANC. Uh, how many black people should benefit compared to white individuals? How many women should benefit compared to men as well as the disabled individual? And on this, and when you look at the definition of what economic growth is, it is inclusive by itself. It's we can see this through objective results. Uh, we can see this through the early administration of the ANC, that of Nelson Mandela and that of Tabum Begi, where GDP levels averaged about 5%. We saw the doubling of employment in the country. We saw people, black individuals uh, that were employed in 1994, essentially double in 2007. We saw indicators such as that of electricity for cooking, as well as to water, increase by levels of 200%. So we can see the objective results of economic growth is that it is inclusive in its very nature, and that it benefits all uh, a group in society, essentially. And this brings the question now as to, like, well, doesn't this only impact the wealthy individuals? Well, why should we care where we see wealth destruction of wealthy individuals? And we should care because it does impact South Africans in general, wherever you come from. Because the misconception that most people have is that, okay, the wealthy individuals only have money money in their bank account. They don't invest it into the economy. This is considered to be a leakage. But what, what people fail to realize is that these wealthy individuals, in order for them to become more wealthy, they need to reinvest in the economy. They do this by investing in companies, be it large business companies or be it small companies. They invested in equity markets, uh, such as that of the GSE. 
And unfortunately, over the last decade, the JSC has been underperforming. There's been currency devaluation as well as the closure of small businesses, uh, mainly because of the decade long of policies that's been uh, quite disastrous for wealth creation. Right. Now, this, this leads. This, if I may just interrupt you there briefly, yeah. this uh, uh, report actually makes mention of that fact that in US dollar terms, the JSC All Share Index is down by 12% over the past 10 years. Yeah, exactly. Now, this leads these wealthy individuals to have very limited options. Now, it's either number one, they can sit by and see their wealth being destroyed, or they just simply move elsewhere where they can make essentially more money. And that's what we've also seen. And this negatively impacts employment within the country because now businesses don't have that investment that comes from savings from these wealthy individuals to essentially start their businesses. And that negatively impacts employment in the country. South Africa's employment rates are about 40%. Which is just half, which is just above half of that of emerging markets of sixty percent, and far behind of that of emer of developed markets of seventy percent. And in order for South Africa to get to those levels of emerging markets and developed markets, we need to add about one million jobs per year for the next ten years. And unfortunately, I don't believe we'll reach that point with the current policies that we see coming from Pretoria. No, I think that's very well said, and. Uh, I think there's another aspect, though, of why South Africa's wealth is, is not growing and in many cases being destroyed beyond just uh, the lack of economic growth and the, the wealth destroying economic policies. And Maurice, I want to get your thoughts on this. But one of the things this report mentions is that the prime residential market, so that's homes valued at over 10 million rand, have become very difficult to sell in the country. And a lot of higher end uh, properties are, are, are on the market right now and are difficult to sell. And I suspect that part of the reason for that is not just lots of people moving away to seek economic opportunities or to protect their, their savings, but also because of a lot of the breakdown in law and order and services and stuff in municipalities around the country. Um, you can see, you know, a lot of people have written on the deterioration in Joburg and how you know, like the roads are cracking, the electricity fails all the time, the water breaks. I think that that's also probably destroying wealth because, you know, a lot of people, their biggest asset they have is their home. And if none of the streetlights are working, crime is on the increase, the water doesn't work half the time and the electricity is out every couple of weeks. It's not going to be the greatest, uh, you know, it's not worth as much as it once was, perhaps when you bought it. Well, what's your take on that, Morris? And what's your thoughts on this wealth issue overall? Yeah, I think uh, that's uh, spot on what you mentioned, uh, or what you mentioned. And um, also another thing, a lot of people don't actually even want to uh, invest in their homes because when you do, your municipal valuation goes up, which increases your rates and taxes you have to pay to the municipality. And often it's, it becomes quite exorbitant. So a lot of people actually prefer just to, you know, they don't upgrade their homes or whatever the case is, which also probably is not going to affect making but uh, more difficult to sell. Uh, but recently, uh, Neil Frenemann, who's the CEO of uh, Sibania Stillwater, it's a gold mining company. It's one of the, uh, I think it's the biggest producer of platinum group metals in the world. I think also think it's the biggest private employer in South Africa. And he was saying one of the reasons, I mean, he, he's been one of the only corporate, big corporate guys who's come out and said, Things are going wrong in South Africa, and this is why we're not investing and what have you. He's the only one who's actually got, you know, most of the other corporates pretty much say, yeah, you know, things will come right. Cyril's actually a good guy. The ANC, we can work with him, what have you. But Neil Froderman hasn't. And uh, one of the reasons what he was saying is, well, you're not going to get any investment from uh, um, foreign companies in South Africa. And whatever your ideological bent is, the fact is we need foreign investment to sustainably beat things like poverty and unemployment. But anyway, what Neil Froderman was saying is that, um, a company will come to South Africa and they'll go invest wherever, say, I don't know, outside Schwarzerenica. And the local community will eventually, they'll see that this company is working well and they'll start price testing. These people won't be have access to electricity or water or if they had now the service has been cut off, they're having no refuse removal, they're getting no luck from the municipality because the municipality is so dysfunctional. So they eventually they can start go, go start protesting outside uh, this company, say it's a mine, whatever the case is, or a big farm, or whatever. So, but now and they expect this uh, company, that's this corporation that's uh, working fairly well, they need to take over what are basic government functions. So what happens is a lot of companies they'll come in. And that's I mean, it's a big, big uh, political and economic risk for companies, and they'll look at it and say, well, look, we're not going to invest here. We can't be expected to take over the government's functions and basic functions like supplying water and electricity. Not you know, not uh, you know, building universities, but completely basic things, you know, and like things like refuse removal. And yeah, so, I mean, all, um, there's there's lots of things why we've seen this wealth destruction and partly it's because uh, in a way the ANC is almost uh, 
uh, explicitly chased uh, wealth away. And also whatever you want to think about wealthy people is, they pay a lot of tax. And also uh, wealthy people don't go live in uh, places where it's um, uh, horrible for poor people to be. They go live in places where they're large middle classes, where if you are a poor person, you have a good uh, good chance of escaping that poverty. Um, as you can see, what they said uh, most in, in that report, uh, most of South Africa's high net worth individuals have moved to UK, US, uh, Australia, None of them have moved to somewhere like Cambodia or, uh, you know, uh, Bolivia or Cuba. You know, they've moved to places where the large middle classes, where the places that are democracies, where wealth is protected and taxes are spent properly, which is, I think is also very important. So, yeah, I mean, uh, that this finding it doesn't surprise me at all. And I'm pretty sure it doesn't surprise anybody who's had even half an hour in South Africa over the past 10 years. Exactly. Uh, these these individuals are key to 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 uh, generating that energy in the economy because they provide so much in terms of taxes and savings. Um, Becky, any closing thoughts on this before we move to our next topic, which is actually uh, quite related to this one? Uh, anything you want to finish off with? Yeah. So a large most of the questions that I usually receive or, uh, from doing the work that I do at the Center for Risk Analysis is to why what why do we see a decline in foreign direct investment and we in order to have foreign direct investment you need to have institutions that incentivize foreign direct investment like what marius touched on such as that of um, property rights as well as independent uh, institutions and the rule of law which is what the anc is fundamentally trying to weaken by such policies such as expropriation without compensation and now with the new trying to impose uh, emp empowerment policies more draconian empowerment policies now and there's a shift that, that, which is something that I touched on earlier, there's a shift within the thinking of the ANC now is that from it now following policies that are growth enhancing, it's now more redistributive. It's no longer about growing the economy, it's now actually extracting wealth within the economy. And that's unfortunately what we're seeing here with the uh, destruction of wealth. Right. Uh, and it's funny that you mentioned uh, BE, stricter BE requirements, because of course that is our next story for today. Um, so let me begin by saying uh, some of you may have heard uh, and indeed may know much more than I do about uh, Elon Musk's project called Starlink. It's a project to, to use low Earth orbit satellites to be able to beam internet services to people without building enormous infrastructure around the, the countryside. Um, so. The idea is that it will be able to basically provide pretty fast, cheap internet to places that normally don't have that kind of stuff. It's already available in the US, UK, Canada, and Australia in a sort of beta testing phase. Um, and it's got some pretty good speeds on its lines. They're saying anywhere between 50 mega, megabits per second and 150 megabits per second with 20 to 40 MS latency. Um, and of course, there were plans to roll it out in South Africa. And in fact, I believe that uh, SpaceX, which is the company that owns the Starlink project, uh, has registered a branch in South Africa to roll it out. However, they have uh, apparently been told by ICASA, which is, I believe, the uh, Independent Commission, uh, Independent Communication. Communication yes, right, Independent Communications Authority of South Africa, um, that if they want a license to use any of the radio frequency spectrum, they need to make sure that they have a minimum of 30% uh, equity held by black South Africans, uh, as they say, determined using the flow through principle. So apparently, according to ICASA, uh, SpaceX does not currently qualify for these requirements. So the question, I guess, is, Marius, what would benefit South Africans more? A wealthy connected black businessman owning 30 percent of spacex's holdings in south africa or cheap free uh, or cheap internet that uh reaches out even to rural south africa well i think if you as you're saying before the show if you're a reactionary and anti-transformation you would say it's to provide uh, the very cheap uh, quick internet for people living in rural south africa or people who can't afford uh you know to pay for wi-fi whatever the case is but of course if you are pro the transformation um uh, aims of the government and the anc you'll obviously support the uh the first way of doing things which will be giving 30 percent of uh style south african uh, uh, entity also south african linked uh, south african based entity uh, link uh, of starlink uh, 
you'd rather give a wealthy connected um, black businessman that 30 percent and i mean uh, it's not going to take a genius to figure out whoever gets given this is not going to be a person who's they're not, they're not going to do a likely to determine who the person is they're not going to draw the name out of the hat or out of a hat it's going to be somebody who's got connections to the anc or somebody within the anc I mean, we we all know ever if it does go through and somebody gets given 30 percent of the company it's going to be somebody we've already heard of before be somebody who's probably already got a couple of positions on various boards and so on and probably quite unlikely that they've uh, done anything to create wealth in their own way. Um, perhaps I'm being a bit unfair on that, but I mean, I doubt it. So yeah, I mean, uh, obviously it's much better for the country to, um, you know, to, uh, use race to determine who owns some of uh, Starlink rather than to roll out uh, very cheap uh, uh, and possibly free internet to uh, places in South Africa that haven't got it before. And that, I mean, that'll change the lives of lots of people in South Africa. If they have, can have access to the internet, I mean, through just... Um, to uh, being able to access information and to help them with schooling and all kinds of things. I mean, it's kind of a new uh, uh, the part of the industrial uh, fourth industrial revolution, which I still don't think we are going to get to in South Africa. But yeah, uh, I think uh, yeah, uh, if, you, if you're pro-transformation, you definitely would want the uh, uh, connected businessmen to get the 30% of Starlink rather than you know cheap internet for the whole country. So two things strike me about this. One is this story is it absolutely perfect example of precisely what we were just talking about as one of the causes of slow economic growth and wealth destruction. But secondly, um, this, uh, actually, Becky, let me get your thoughts first before before I, I ramble on. <laughs> so Becky, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, unfortunately, Elon Musk can leave South Africa, but our nonsense will keep on catching up. <laughs> it's just unfortunate. Uh, it's just unfortunate. And the thing about these affirmative action policies is that they have the opposite intended consequence of, of the objective. Uh, like what Marius touched on is that they exacerbate the inequalities amongst the black population. Only the politically connected will receive that Starlink uh, deal, will get ownership in Starlink, and the vast majority of black individuals will not. And uh, it is unfortunate because I think it was about a year or two ago, Stats published the Gini coefficient research on this and actually showed the dis uh, disparities amongst racial groups, showing that uh, amongst the black population itself, it's the most unequal across all other racial groups. And it's because of such policies such as BEE, where only a few percentage of the black population benefits and only those politically connected do. And, and this, sorry this, to interrupt, Becky, I just no. want to say that it was also the only group that saw inequality grow over the period exactly. under study. Black, uh, colored Indian white people all saw inequality stay the same or decline. Black people saw it grow exactly. within the black population. Exactly. And that's also, in a funny way, used to sort of be more draconian with uh, affirmative mm -hmm. action. Uh, and the issues often ignored. And, and this actually also brings some of the thinking that I've also seen. Wasn't it an issue that South Africa has a lack of broadband? Uh, we needed more internet connectivity. Right. And now and now we've been offered that. Was, that I was going to bring up, we had a whole yeah. data must fall movement. Exactly. Internet is too expensive. We can't afford data. It's preventing exactly. starting small business. Yeah. Exactly. Now here <laughs> it is. And here it is, and now we're offering regulations that uh, offer a risk that Starlink will probably not be willing to bear and to simply move elsewhere. They have a choice to move elsewhere and, and offer that broadband to that following country. Now South Africa loses out. And it is unfortunate, and uh, it's something that unfortunately we, we know, and speaks to the theme that I see in this discussion, that it's a move now towards wealth extraction rather than that of wealth creation. Mm. Right. And, and and what's funny about this also is that it's actually not just black ownership, but of course, the government doesn't want to leave any special group out. So you must comply with racial <laughs> equity uh, uh, requirements. But you also, if you're an Internet service provider, must comply with uh, making sure that you have enough women, people with disabilities and youth <laughs> in your... <laughs> so, so, so what happens... If, if, if you if, say you define youth to be to 35, say your board is made up 40% of the youth and they all have their birthday on the same day, they all turn 35 on the same day, what happened is suddenly your, your, your you know, youth complement has gone. And it's exactly the same people on the group or on the board, but just because they've suddenly aged by one day, you know, it's ridiculous. <laughs> Come on. Right. It's just, it's just madness. So this is, this is why we can't have nice things in a nutshell. It's a really good example of that. But of also, 
wants to wrap bureaucratic tape around every single possibility for innovation. But also, it's a it's a kind of a it's a South African illness. Uh, we we all think a lot of people believe in the South African exceptionalism, and there is no such thing. Each country is unique in its own way, including South Africa. But we mustn't think that we are entitled to investment from overseas. There's so many countries that look at all the kind of things that they have to uh, fulfill and the regulations in South Africa, and they'll just you know what we'll go wherever we'll go to Vietnam or Thailand or. Uh, Chile or whatever the case is, you know, also countries with similar size populations and we don't have to follow all this kind of stuff. And that's the thing we've got to realize. South Africa is one of 190 countries in the world. You know, we know we're not entitled to, um, and we, we've got some some advantages. I mean, we still got uh, quite a big uh, mining endowment, but that's also, you know, companies also only going to put up with so much. We've seen how South Africa's mining sector shrunk, despite us still having quite a uh, significant uh, deposits of metals and so on in in, uh, well, in the country. In the coal reserves. Exactly. And I mean, that's something that Neil Fernemann has said, uh, to come back to him. He also said, they, you know, not even his country, but other uh, companies as well, they're not going to get involved or put in new projects in South Africa while there's all these kinds of race laws and regulations that have to be followed, which don't benefit anybody. And I mean, we recently saw that Anglo-American actually has no um, assets in South Africa anymore. And it's actually... You know, that's, that's a company that used to dominate the South African economy. It's been part of, you know, it's been uh, part of South Africa's history and South Africa's economic history since, I think, about the Boer War. And, um, you know, now it doesn't have any assets in the country anymore whatsoever. You know, so we'll get some people on the left who will we'll celebrate this, but it's not, it's not something to be celebrated. I mean, so many jobs get created by big companies like that. Uh, you know, the downflow, uh, downstream effects of uh, companies like that, the tax they pay to the fiscus and what have you. So when it comes to South Africa, it's not something to be celebrated. It's something to be mourned. Right. Um, but of course, the people who celebrate that kind of thing are almost always insolent, insulated from the consequences. And insolent. But, yeah, uh, which is unfortunately <laughs> borne by the millions and millions of South Africans who are without jobs. Uh, Becky, any any final thoughts on this topic before we move on to to the love of Morris's life? Uh, just the final thought on this topic. I'm not sure what exactly could add to this conversation, but it's it's just something that I've been thinking about. You know, economists have something called a lead indicator. It's an uh, indicator that sort of predicts what's going to happen in the country. In the US, they have the unemployment claims that tells you what's going to happen to unemployment in the US at the end of the month. And I think in many aspects, South Africa is a lead indicator for some of the culture wars that we see happening in, Amer in America. Most of these affirmative right. action policies, most of these empowerment policies are now what we're seeing in the US. And I just thought that it's actually kind of funny that now Elon Musk is sort of now dealing that on both ends, both <laughs> now in the South African sense and now in the US sense. And, right. and unfortunately, we can see the consequence of that in South Africa is that we've become less competitive. Companies are now moving offshore, investing in other countries because of these right. regulations and, in, and affirmative action policies. And, and, and also speaks to what's going to happen in the US as well. I think we're going to see less competitiveness when compared to the US to other countries as well. Right. And, uh, and uh, that's actually, sure, go ahead, Morris. I was going to say, I think Elon Musk is also quite aware of the culture wars. I think on Twitter, he, um, he shared a picture of uh, Karl Marx and says, uh, Das Kapital summarized. And it's a picture of Karl Marx and a quote under Karl Marx saying, Give me that. So I think he's quite aware. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, uh, yeah, you, you just reminded me, actually, uh, Becky, of if you are a proponent of BE or if you're looking to find arguments for why BE uh, isn't such a great idea. There are actually two great historical examples of places where it doesn't work. Uh, there are two countries in the world that have done affirmative action in various forms for much longer than we have, and they are Malaysia and the United States. And you will notice if you look into the histories and economies of those countries that those policies have done absolutely nothing to change the, the fundamental kind of racial divisions and the bank racial tensions and stuff in those countries. In fact, in some cases, they seem to have made them worse. Um, so I don't know why South Africa ever thought that it could somehow be different. Uh, I suppose maybe it's this exceptionalism thing you're talking about, Maurice. But anyway, we should learn from overseas and not just simply do I the same I just want to thing. quickly uh, mention something. Yeah, there was, um, uh, I actually uh, saw this tweet yesterday, the day before, 
And uh, it says by a guy called Imran S, who calls himself a global aficionado, classical liberal, and capitalism of the heart. So he kind of fits in with our kind of way of thinking. But anyway, he's a Malaysian guy, and he says, the nature of Malaysian society is why I'm against work identity politics. Identity and race uh, permeates everything, yeah. Our political parties, our public discourse, our public policies, our economic policies, etc. It hobbles progress because everything is a zero-sum game. And I think you could just change Malaysia to South Africa and it would be completely spot on. No, exactly. And of course, there it's not black versus white, it's Malaysian mm. versus Chinese, Malaysian versus and Indians. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Tamil, yeah. Anyway. anyway, so uh, I'm sure we're going to come back to this discussion <laughs> soon because unfortunately uh, the government is not quite yet taking our advice, but I'm sure we'll get through to them eventually. And let's talk now uh, once again about the love of Morris's life, which is cricket in South Africa. Um, we recently talked about the debacle, I think, when Morris was last on the show of Cricket SA. Well, there's been a further development, and we'll just very briefly talk about it here. Um, a, a number of South Africa's cricketers have apologized to sponsors and fans for the administrative upheaval that has been rocking cricket South Africa, that has involved ministerial interventions and politics on the board and statements about transformation and things like that. So, Marius, can you tell us a little bit about um, what exactly is going on and what your thoughts are on this this apology? Uh, yeah, so just basically what happened is that uh, the members um, uh, council in uh, of Cricket South Africa, which is made up of all the different provincial presidents, uh, they decided to uh, not go along with the new restructuring of Cricket South Africa as proposed by the interim board. Uh, so this means that uh, there's really no governance or anybody in control of Cricket South Africa, which has meant that Martin Tetwa, the Minister of Sport, has had to take over. Uh, the, uh, or he's had to get involved in uh, the running of the game. So the, the National Sports and Recreation Act gives him Tetwa the right to withdraw CSA status as the game's governing body, which means that national teams can no longer claim to represent South Africa. And this could also mean that South Africa actually gets banned from international cricket because the International Cricket Council also prevents uh, governments from being involved in uh, sport. Um, uh, so, oh, sorry, from uh, getting involved in crickets and so on. So what happened is, uh, so it's still going to be, uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. The RCC is uh, still investigating. It's still too soon to say whether we are going to get um, uh, kicked out of crickets. But uh, what was interesting is that uh, the national captains, Dean Algo is the captain of the test side, Timber Bavuma, the captain of the ODI and T20 sides, Danae van Nekka, who is the captain of the women's side, and uh, Kai Zondo, who is the president of the African Cricket Association, have apologized to the sports uh, to the sports fans in South Africa and to the uh, uh, sponsors and so on, and they said they hope that uh, what they say as players we speak directly to the main sponsor of the game, etc. Recognize, acknowledge the involvement of the game, and they just uh, uh, they apologize for the actions of our administrators who have undermined and betrayed the commitment to the sport. And finally, to the most important stake on the game, the public, we ask that you continue sport cricket. It is the most wonderful game, and we're immensely proud to represent you on the field. So it's um, so, um, so <laughs> yes, I see your dogs are just up. Right? Every time wow. you think about cricket, your dog barks. <laughs> every time I don't know, I think you think likes cricket about... too. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so yeah, that's. Uh, that's kind of what's going on with uh, cricket South Africa at the moment. So it's uh, the RCC has, you know, as um, in a roundabout way, actually welcomed the government's intervention. They've said not all government intervention is bad, so we could see what happens. But yeah, it's uh, going to be tricky times for the sport in South Africa. It also faces some financial hurdles at the moment. So yeah, I think uh, all cricket lovers should probably be right to worry. And isn't the, and also there's some global issues with the game. Lots of money is only flowing to what they call the big three, England, India, and Australia. And it's bad for, yeah, uh, any any cricket lover who worries about the st sustainability of the game should uh, be a bit concerned, I think. Indeed. Uh, and hopefully we can soon expunge the demons of mismanagement, corruption, and race from uh, our cricket teams so that, you know, we can just enjoy the game instead of causing endless embarrassment <laughs> to, the national, to the national side and psyche. I'm afraid we don't have uh, time to, to, to continue on today, uh, but thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining me. And thank you to all of our listeners and watchers who uh, support this show and uh, share it uh, with with the wider world and promote our stuff. We really do appreciate your, 
your efforts on our behalf. Um, anyway, thank you very much. Uh, we hope you enjoyed. And tomorrow we will be on with, I believe, uh, Mr. Gabriel Krauser, who's going to tell us a little bit about his uh, adventures, let, let us call them, in Petra Tief and uh, what's going on with that controversial trial over there. Anyway, we hope you enjoyed and have a wonderful day. Cheers.